The message I want to share for this morning is called this, Is It Up To You? Is It Up To You? I want to share, first of all, a text of Scripture, if you want to turn in your Bibles or turn in your devices. And it's of the persistent widow in the book of Luke, chapter 18, verse 1 to 8. And to me, it's a, a powerful text of Scripture, and I thought it was so relevant when I was talking to Sandra early on this week. And Jesus then told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not become discouraged. Do you see the key words there of Jesus? The need, say the need, for them to pray when? Always. See, I wonder right now, if you're watching, I wonder right now where we are, how much time have you spent in prayer? Uh, This morning, uh, I was out on a track with the dog about uh, quarter to four this morning maybe a bit before that, uh, six Ks, about a, under an hour, 50 minutes, not to, to brag about, but just with the dog, going through the bush and the track. And one of the things I love about that morning, because the sun hasn't come up, is that it's me, the dog, and God. Not that the dog is necessarily aware of God, but I am aware of God. And I'm out there, and I'm praying, and I'm thinking about the things of God, and I'm meditating. You see, this is what Jesus is saying. He told them a parable on the need for them to pray always and not become discouraged. Remember the word dis means? It means to undo. When we become discouraged is we undo the courage. God wants you to be courageous right now, not fearful. Verse 2, and there was a judge in a certain town who did not fear God. And he did not respect man. And there was a widow. And in that town, she kept coming to the judge saying, give me justice against my adversary. You know, the Bible says there is this judge, there is this person in leadership who didn't believe in God and didn't respect his fellow man. Isn't that like today? Now, thank goodness we have a prime minister who believes in God and has a reverence, but there are a lot of other political persons in our state who want to be in our local city, and I'm sure in the federal area, that has no respect about God and therefore has little respect about his fellow man. In other words, Jesus has always prepared a truth for us, no matter what the situation is. And it says in verse 4, For a while this judge was unwilling, but later he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect man, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice so she doesn't wear me out by her persistent coming. Then the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. Will not God grant justice to his elect? That means his chosen, his fellow followers, who cry out to him day and night. See, is there any wonder why I want to pray? God says, do I not turn my ear to hear those who cry out to me day and night? It's not just corporate prayer, but it's our individual prayer. Like how much time you spent calling out to God in comparison to reading the bad news? Or listening to the bad news. How much time have you spent saying, God, hear the cries of your son. Hear the cries of your children. Hear the cries of your people. This is a promise. It says this, will not God grant justice to those who cry out to him day and night? Will he delay to help them? I tell you that he will swiftly grant them justice. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find that faith on earth? Will he find such faith on earth? In life, our first job is to divide and distinguish things into two categories. Those are the external things, the things I cannot control. But then there are the things I can control, and that is my choice. Life can be divided into two categories. The things I cannot control and the things I cannot control. Where will you find good and bad? In the choices that you make. I was reading a story about this infamous American baseball player. I had never heard of him before. But the more I read about his story, the more I was inspired about it. And I thought I'd share it this morning. His name is Tommy John. Just his name is unique. Tommy John. It's like Shane Sean. It's, it's, it's got an unusual combination, right? Tommy John. 
Have you ever met somebody that has a last name that sounds like a name and you've called them the last name rather than... Like there's a guy I like, I knew him like that. His name is Scott Russell. And great guy. But for so long, I'd call him Russell instead of Scott because both names was like a first name, Scott Russell. There's another guy, he's a pastor called Brian Andrews. And I used to call him Andrew by mistake instead of Brian. Have you ever? I'm the only one, okay. So this guy's called Tommy John, TJ. And he's known as one of the best American baseball players. He was savvy and durable. He was a pitcher. Now listen to this. He played 26 seasons in the majors, the professional. That's 26 years in the majors. In his rookie year, in his rookie year, President Kennedy was president. In his final years, George H.W. Bush was president. He pitched to one of the American greats, Mickey Mantle. I mean, this guy to be a pitcher in the major leagues for 26 years in American baseball, well, for us, it's like a fast bowler playing 26 years for Australia. The amount of damage that's done to the shoulder or the arm is insurmountable. It's just superhuman. But when he's asked how he was able to do this, he says he's able to do it because he got really good at asking himself a particular question over and over again. This is what he said. I'd ask myself this. Is there a chance? Do I have a shot? Is there something I can do? Now, think about that in this time we're in. Is there a chance? Do you have a shot? Is there something that you can do? All he ever looked for was a yes. No matter how slight or how, or how tentative that chance was, he looked for a yes. Yes. When Margaret and Colin were dealing with a tragedy with their son Stephen losing his legs. What I admire so much about them was they could have been overcome with doom and gloom, but there's always this, yes, there is a chance. We can't control what's happened, but yes, there's hope in how we overcome and get the victory. Their son is home now in record time. If there was a chance, Tommy John was ready to take it and make good use of it ready to give every ounce of effort and energy he had to make it happen. If effort would affect the outcome, he said he would die in the field before he left that chance go to waste. His first challenge came in the middle of the 1974 season. This pitcher did what pitchers fear. He blew out his arm. He permanently damaged the ligament in his pitching elbow. Now, up until this point in baseball, you have to understand that sports medicine, when a pitcher blew out the arm, they said, that's it. It was called dead arm, dead arm. There was no recovery. There was no surgery. There was nothing. It was your career's over. That's how it was. But Tommy John refused to accept it. And he was saying, was there anything that could give him a shot to get back on the mound? Is there anything that could give him a chance? And it turns out there was. There was this suggested experimental surgery. Do you hear me? Suggested experimental surgery. Where they would try to replace the ligament in his pitching elbow with a tendon from his other arm. Now remember, it was experimental. It was untested. He said to the doctors, what are the chances of me coming back after this surgery? They said, one in a hundred, one percent. And they said, and what about if I don't have the surgery? What are my chances of coming back? Zero. One percent chance. One percent. I hear about the Australian doctors moving ahead right now with a, 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 a cure or a hopeful cure 
I was reading about it last night and again this morning where they've experimented on a couple of people and they've had positive results to where now they're looking to do 50 hospitals and experimenting it. To me, that encourages me. To other people, it's like, I don't trust it. People will die. Well, people are going to die anyhow. You see, this guy, Tommy John, would jump at 1% chance. 1%. Remember, untested, experimental. One in 100 chance. With rehab and training, he had a chance. Do you know what? After that surgery, in the next 13 seasons, that's 13 years, he was a part of a winning 164 more games. Now to you, it doesn't sound like much, but you have to understand the surgery is so revolutionary that that procedure is now known as the Tommy John surgery. Less than 10 years later, he had to muster that same spirit and effort that he felt for the elbow surgery when his young son had a terrible fall from a third story window. His young son swallowed his tongue and almost died. And in the chaos of the emergency room, with doctors convinced that the boy would probably not survive, Tommy John reminded his family that whether it took one year or 10 years, they would not give up until there was absolutely nothing left that they could do. His son made a full recovery. Now for Tommy John, his baseball career seemed to finally come to an end in 1988. This is it. He was 45 years old. The Yankees said, that's your final year, you're finished. But still, at 45 years of age, he would not accept it. So he called up the coach of the Yankees and he demanded, he said, if I showed up at the spring training camp as a walk-in, meaning there's no contract, I just walk in. If I showed up at the next spring training camp as a walk-in, would you give me a fair look? The Yankees responded and said, you're too old. Your time has come. Let it go. But Tommy John is this persistent. And he said, look, just be straight with me. If I come back here in spring, would you give me a chance? And the baseball officials answered, okay, you'll get one look. One look if you come back in the spring for the tryouts. So Tommy John was the first to report to camp that spring. He trained in that off season for hours and hours and hours every day. Every lesson that he had learned playing the sport for a quarter century, he applied to his life and being. You want to know what? He made the team. He was the oldest player ever in the game, coming into 46 years of age. He made the team. And he started the season opener, and they won. The things that Tommy John could change when he had a chance got a full 100% of the effort that he could muster. See, that's the key. The things that you can change, the things that you can influence, the things that are affected by your decision, give it 100% attention. You know, in the Christian circles, especially those who go through recovery and addicts, there's a prayer. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's called the serenity prayer. Have you heard of that before? The serenity prayer. And it goes like this. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, but the courage to change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Anybody who's gone through a recovery program should be familiar with what we call the serenity prayer. Listen to it. God, grant me the serenity, the peace, to accept the things I cannot change. But also, God, give me the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. I like that last part, the wisdom to know the difference. The wisdom to know there are things I can't change and the wisdom to know that there are things that I can't fight for. 
In the field of addiction, this is how they're trying to focus their efforts. See, they'd be saying to them, it's a lot easier to fight addiction if you weren't also fighting the fact that you were born or that your parents were monsters or that you lost everything. In other words, all those things you can't change. Zip, zero. But what you can change is now and today. What you can change is your attitude. What you can change is not accepting or taking the things you shouldn't take. So what if during this pandemic, we focus on what we can change? What if we focus on what we can change? Behind the serenity prayer is a 2,000 year old stoic phrase. So stoic is meaning you know, without emotion, it's a Greek thing. And excuse my old Greek because I'm not that hot on it, but just bear with me. And it goes like this. Ta ephemen, ta och ephemen. Does it sound okay? All right, we'll try it. <laughs> ta ephemen, ta och ephemen. In other words, it says this in English. What is up to us, what is not up to us. What is up to us, what is not up to us. <laughs> my wife has a fantastic heritage, you know. Uh, Chinese heritage, born in Papua New Guinea when it was an Australian territory, uh, Aussie. When I was young with Sandra and coming to a family dinner, the challenge was they would speak when they're all together three different languages. I don't even think they realize it. But it would jump from a few words in English, a couple words in Pidgin, and a couple words in Cantonese. So when I'm out of dinner, and they didn't realize they're speaking three different languages because they could understand each. So Sandra might start something in English, it would flow into Pidgin and finish off in Cantonese, and then she'd say to me, do you get it? Uh, uh, sure. So Sandra has this statement in Pigeon. How correct I am, I don't know. But when something happens around us or something happens with a person's decision that maybe we're not totally happy with, but do it, she just says in Pigeon, something belong all. Meaning, it's up to them, it's out of my control. Something belong all. It's their decision. I, I can't do anything about it. That's, that's their thing. I think of that in regards to this very thing. Ta ephemen, ta ach ephemen. What is up to us, what is not up to us. That's how I see it. So what is up to us? I'm glad you asked. Our emotions. Yeah. Our judgments. Our creativity. Our attitude. Our perspective our desires, our decisions, our determination. I said to Pastor Shane and Sandra, I so enjoyed prayer as we were together these last couple of days on Friday and Saturday. I said, we've got to do this every week. Whether it's just us or others, we've got to do it. On Wednesday night, 6.30 to 7.30. On Friday night, 6.30 to 7.30. There's just something about being with same like-minded people Amen. where we just call out to God. See, this is our playing field, so to speak. What is not up to us? The weather, the economy, the circumstances, other people's emotions, judgments, trends. What's not up to us? The pandemic. But what is up to us is our playing field. What is not up to us are the rules and the conditions of the game. I tell people, don't play the decision. Play the whistle. It's not up to me as to how many are allowed to gather. That's out of my control. 
that could change next week. It's not up to me what restrictions will be brought in. That's out of my playing field. So I don't bother. I don't get upset or heated. It's not up to me if people hoard things from the grocery store. There's nothing I can do about it. Something belong all. <laughs> but what is up to me is how I react and how I interact and how I relate. I've negotiated with a supplier in fruit and vegetables that next Saturday I can get a special supply of fruit and vegetables that is compatible, if not cheaper, than what the other areas are doing to be a blessing to those who are interested. And I'm looking to do that just for a couple hours on Saturday morning, 7 to 9, 7 to 10, if you're interested with fresh fruit and vegetables because even those things are getting out of control. That is in my control. where I can reach out and speak life. It is in my control where you will know that your pastors are standing in the gap and praying. It is in our control that I can say God is with us. Don't panic and don't give up. I can't determine what the rules are, but I can determine how I will react. To argue, to complain, or to just give up, these are choices, and they're choices that I don't want to make. This is the difference between the people who can accomplish great things and the people who find it impossible to stay sound, sober, etc. The most harmful dragon, if I could say, that we chase is the one that makes us think that we can change the things that are simply not ours to change. I can't change the rules of the game right now. I can't change the situation of this pandemic. But I can take charge of me and what I want to do. To focus exclusively on what is in my power magnifies, enhances our power in him. But every ounce of energy that is directed at things that I can't influence is wasted, self-indulgent, self-destructive. Not only to me, but others who relate to me. To see an obstacle as a challenge, to make the best of it anyway, that's a choice. And it's a choice that is up to us. Can the musicians come up? So, as the baseball has said, Will I have a chance, coach? Ta F Hemen. It's up to me. Ta F Hemen. It is up to me. The ball is in my court. And I have decided with Sandra and with our pastors. That in this place of uncertainty, in this place that is foreign to us, we stand firm, we stand true, and we stand in faith. Amen. For those of you who are watching online, for those of us here right now this morning, be steadfast, unmovable in your